let me put on the recording. And I hope you guys can hear me. Am I loud enough? Can you people hear me? Am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, so let me share my screen and begin. Today we're looking at inductive reasoning. In our last class, we were talking about deductive reasoning. We said it is reasoning in which the relationship between the premises and the conclusion is logical. And we're saying that like in mathematics, the meaning of the content of a deductive argument don't matter because what matters is the logical relationship between the premises and the conclusion. So we saw four different kinds of valid deductive arguments and any of them can be valid, but not true, you know. So the logical relationship is very important for the validity of deductive arguments. But for inductive reasoning, the relationship between the premises and the conclusion is not logical. So it is possible to affirm all the premises and deny the conclusion without contradiction because the premises are capable of producing more than one conclusion. So we saw in our last example of an inductive argument, we saw that it could generate more than one possible conclusion. So in that case, you need to look at the meanings of contents and then use common sense to determine for yourself if the argument is you know, cogent enough for you to accept. Now for inductive arguments, premises provide reason for believing in the likelihood of the conclusion, but premises don't guarantee the conclusion. So inductive arguments are probability arguments because in inductive arguments don't depend on rules. They are harder to evaluate. You know, so when you see an argument that generates more than one possible conclusion, you spend more energy trying to decide which, and which conclusion you want to accept. You know, but if it is an argument that generates only one possible conclusion, you don't need any energy to know the, uh, you know, to know that it is acceptable. So inductive arguments are more difficult to evaluate compared to deductive arguments. Now let's make some clarifications. This one is between verifiable and confirmable statements. Verifiable statements are statements we can directly test or verify. They are usually factual or empirical statements. Example, Kofi lost strength with age. You know, so you can verify it because you know what Kofi was able to do in the past and what he can do now. You know, if there is a reduction, then you know you has, he has lost strength. So that's a, a verifiable statement. But we have confirmable statements, statements that we cannot test or verify directly, except through verifiable statements. Example, all men lose strength with age. You know, so all men lose strength with age, you can't verify it directly. So look at this combination. You have premises that are verifiable statements, and then you have a conclusion that is a confirmable statement. Kofi lost strength with age, Rita lost strength with age, and so on. Therefore, all men lose strength with age. So the premises are verifiable statements. The conclusion is a confirmable statement. This is another example. Mary reached menopause by 40. Grace reached menopause by 35. Meredith reached menopause by 33, and so on. Therefore, half of all women will reach menopause by 35. So the premises are six. Three of them are saying that three women reach menopause by 35. The other three are saying that three other women reach menopause after 35. So the conclusion says half of all women will reach menopause by 35. So verifiable statements are the premises. Confirmable statement is the conclusion. 
Now, how do you detect a confirmable statement? First of all, we said confirmable statements are not directly testable or verifiable. But the second one is that they can be converted into conditional statements. So any statement you can convert into a conditional statement is a confirmable statement. Example, this is a categorical statement. No leader steps down from power unless compared by a coup or constitution. Now, if you are to convert it to a conditional, if X is a leader, then X will not step down unless compared by a coup or constitution. You know, so that means that this is a confirmable statement. You cannot convert a verifiable statement into a conditional. Then we have another distinction between finite and infinite reference classes. In our last class, we saw this distinction and we were saying that the finite reference class is a class of countable items, examples, this copper, that man, some boys, that table, and so on. And then the infinite reference class is a class of uncountable items, example, all metals, all men, all voters, and so on. So we need that distinction because of this the distinction between law-like and statistical hypothesis. Law-like hypotheses are confirmable statements that refer to all members of a class. That's the infinite uh, reference class. For example, all metals expand when heated. You know, so I have already said that confirmable statements are the conclusions of inductive arguments. So there are two kinds of confirmable statements. You have law-like hypothesis, you have statistical hypothesis. So that tells you that the conclusions of inductive arguments are not only confirmable statements, they are also called hypotheses. So the law-like hypotheses are confirmable statements that refer to all members of a class. That's the infinite reference class. All metals expand when heated. If X is a metal, then X will expand when heated. All Fs are Gs. If F, each F is a G. No Fs are Gs, all Fs are not Gs. Now, law-like hypotheses are highly predictive. G must be attributed or not attributed to every F. You know. So by now you can see that inductive arguments are used mostly in the sciences. You know, those examples we saw are you know, like scientific arguments. Three women reached their menopause before the age of 35. And then another three women reached their menopause after the age of 35. Therefore, half of all women will reach their menopause before the age of 35. So that's, that looks like a scientific, an experiment, a data gathering. Now that conclusion is a hypothesis. And then the person who formulated the hypothesis went to gather data about women and then the person gathered this data about six women. So now when you come to science, prediction is very important in science. Uh, and uh, what we're saying here is that um, the law-like hypotheses are highly predictive. Now, if you say that, if you say that all Fs are Gs, look at the bottom of this slide. If you say that all Fs are Gs, then that means that G must be attributed or not attributed to every F. All men are mortal. If Peter is a man, then Peter is mortal. Anything that is a man is very predictably mortal. So if you say that all members of a class have a certain quality, possess a certain quality or property, it means that anything you identify as a member of that class must have that property or quality. So that's why law-like hypothesis is highly predictive. But if you say that only some members of a class have a particular quality or property, and then you, you identify, you, if you identify something as a member of that class, then it is less predictable. You are not very sure whether that thing has that property because not all members have it. Now, this is statistical hypothesis. So these are confirmable statements referring to some percentage less than 100 and more than zero. Example, 90% of those who ate the food fell sick. Now it uses, it is, it is not only percentages, 
that are used for statistical hypothesis. Statistical hypothesis can also use other statistical terms like some, few, many, most, hardly any, you know, and so on. Now, statistical hypotheses are less predictive. If you say that 90% of those who fell, ate the food fell sick, or probably even 50%, and if you say X ate the food, then X is likely to fall sick. But, you know, the predictability is less because it is 90% or 50%. If it is 100% of those who ate the food fell sick, that's it, like a law-like hypothesis, and you say X ate the food, then you are sure that X will fall sick. That's why law-like hypothesis is more predictable. It, it, it has a higher predictability. But statistical hypotheses are less predictable compared to law-like hypothesis. You know. If you say it is 90% or 50% and you said X ate the food, you are not sure if X is among those who fell sick or those who did not fall sick. Then confirmation versus proof. Inductive arguments are aimed at confirmation. Now, when we talk about confirmation in logic, confirmation in critical thinking is not as strong as confirmation in uh, you know the way we use it in our ordinary activities you know in real life we 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 assume that confirmation is as strong as proof or guarantee you know but in logic confirmation is not as strong as those those uh, those other terms uh, confirmation is not proof Inductive arguments are aimed at confirmation. Deductive arguments are aimed at proof. In fact, another name for deductive arguments uh, is deductive proofs. When you see an, a deductive argument, you can call it a deductive proof because it is as uh, far proof you know, as a mathematical calculation. It is as accurate as a mathematical calculation. So you can call it a deductive proof, not just a, a deductive argument or a deductive syllogism. Deductive arguments are aimed at proof. Confirmation is not proof. Another issue is that evidence, physical evidence, you know, in real life, we think that physical evidence, uh, you know, can completely prove an argument. But in logic and in science, you see that physical evidence also has its limitations. Now, we will soon see the limitations of physical evidence. Before then, let's look at two major ways to detect inductive arguments. So how do we detect inductive arguments? There are two ways to detect, uh, detect inductive arguments. Already we have said this one. They are capable of more than one conclusion. So 90% of those who ate the food fell sick, Ama ate the food. There are two conclusions. Ama fell sick, Ama did not fall sick. Those two conclusions are, are valid. Because Amma could be among the 90% who fell sick or among the 10% who did not fall sick. So inductive arguments are capable of producing more than one conclusion. But there's another way of detecting inductive arguments. Inductive arguments are extrapolations. An extrapolation is an activity that smuggles in information into the conclusion that is absent in any of the premises. Now, when you look at an inductive argument, you see that the conclusion always contains a piece of information that is not in any of the premises. Or the conclusion is making an assumption that doesn't have any warrant in any of the premises. All inductive conclusions contain information not accounted in the premises. Now, look at this technicality of induction. A known pin A has certain properties such as X, Y, and Z. Another pin B that is not in the premises has the same properties X, Y, and Z. Now, so A and B have these three properties, identical. Then A also has an additional property Q. Now, on the basis of the above three premises, the argument concludes, or in reality extrapolates, that B also has the additional property Q. So just because A and B have similar properties X, Y, Z, when you notice that A has another property Q and you don't know whether B has Q or not, 
you assume that because both of them already have three identical properties, uh, then it means that if A has Q, B could also have Q. The idea of induction then is that if B is like A in some respects, it may also be like A in other respects. But you know that this argument is not strong enough because it could be that B doesn't have Q. The fact that both of them have X, Y, Z doesn't mean that any other property that A has, B will also have it. So that's the technicality of inductive arguments or the technicality of induction. Now let's look at different directions of extrapolations, which will show you the structure of different kinds of inductive arguments based on the direction of extrapolation. First of all, we have part whole extrapolations, that is attributing something to a whole that constitutes a part or parts. We have two types of part whole extrapolations. We have generalizations and then we have statistical syllogisms. Generalization is Peter is strong, James is strong, therefore all men are strong. Peter is strong, James is strong, so all men are strong. So you are generalizing from Peter and James to all men. You can see that it's not a strong argument. Then we have statistical syllogisms. Most Canadian university students drink alcohol. Caroline is a Canadian university student. Therefore, Caroline drinks alcohol. You can see that this argument is not strong. You can also say Caroline doesn't drink, does not drink alcohol. Because you said most. Caroline could be among the few who don't drink. So again, this argument is porous. Then we have analogies, arguing that something possesses the same thing as another because they both possess some other properties. So we saw this just now. We call it an analogy. Example, the structural adjustment program was good for Cameroon, which is a third world country. The structural adjustment program was good for Uganda, which is a third world country. The structural adjustment program was good for Senegal, which is a third world country. The structural adjustment program was good for Nigeria, which is a third world country. Therefore, the structural adjustment program must be good for Togo, which is a third world country. So you can see there's an extrapolation. Now this argument is saying that because all these countries are sharing a certain common uh, property, which is that they are third world countries. If a program worked in one or more of these countries, then it should work in the others. But that argument is not strong enough. You can't say because all these countries are third world countries, anything you, you put into this country, it works here, it will also work here. So this argument by analogy. Now, another form of this argument is to say, okay, um, Peter and Paul are six feet tall. Peter and Paul are six feet, four, uh, six feet tall. Peter just got married to a tall woman. So Paul will get married to a tall woman. So just because Peter and Paul are tall, and then you notice that Peter has married a tall woman, it's not enough to conclude that Paul will marry a tall woman. So that's what this argument looks like. Then we have predictions, attributing a quality to a future event because of the level of frequency of past occurrences of the same quality in similar events. So Tyson has won his last 30 boxing fights. Therefore, Tyson will win his next box boxing fight. Uh, so you can see that um, the conclusion is about the future based on the past, but the past and the future are not the same, you know? So the conclusion is saying something, is presenting an information that is not in the premises because the next boxing fight has no relationship with the ones that took place in the past. You know? So predictions are another form of inductive arguments. Now there are two kinds of inductive arguments based on their strength one of them is stronger than the other. You know, we call them enumerative inductive arguments. Enumerative argument is an argument with many premises. That is, you enumerate the premises like a list. The first kind of inductive argument is the ones that end with law-like hypothesis as conclusion. 
The second one is the one that ends with statistical hypothesis as conclusions. So law-like hypothesis and statistical uh, hypothesis, they form the two kinds, the two major kinds of inductive arguments based on strength. Now let's look at law-like, the arguments that end with law-like hypothesis as conclusions. This is an example. We have 10 premises. This is an experiment of, you know, an experiment whereby uh, you heat up some metals to see if they will expand. Gold expanded when heated. Silver expanded when heated. Bronze expanded when heated. Copper expanded when heated and so on. So 10 different metals expanded when heated. And then the summary premise is that all the metals tested so far expanded when heated. Then the conclusion is that all metals expand when heated. Now you notice that there's a difference between the premises and the conclusion. The premises are particular statements, but the conclusion is a general statement. Even the summary of the premises is a particular statement. All the metals tested so far, that's a particular statement. You can count the metals that have been tested so far. But the conclusion is referring to all metals, which you cannot count. So that means that the conclusion contains an information that is not present in any of the premises. And that information is uh, all metals. All metals are uncountable, but 10 metals are countable. All the metals tested so far are countable. So that means that there, there was a jump from particular premises to general conclusion. That jumping is fallacious because there's no basis to take a decision on all metals based on 10 metals. All metals means all the metals you have not even discovered, they are, which are still in the ground, you know. Now, this is the technicality. Premises one to 10 are verifiable or particular statements. The summary premise is a summation of all the verifiable premises, but the conclusion is a confirmable and general statement. So that means the argument is strictly invalid. It involves jumping from verifiable to confirmable statements. And that's the reason why confirmation is not proof and inductive arguments are not valid. Now, so now as it turns out, the conclusion is false. Some metals in fact do not expand when heated. They are called superconductors. They don't absorb heat, so they cannot expand. So the conclusion is false and all the premises are true. So it is possible to deny, it just happens that the person who did his experiment, he didn't come across any superconductors, that is metals that don't expand when heated. So the conclusion is false and all the premises are true. So it is possible to deny a conclusion with all true premises or affirm premises and deny conclusion. And this is applicable to all the types of extrapolation, parts, whole, analogies, predictions. So we're done looking at inductive arguments. We've seen how they are. Now let's look at, uh, com let's make a comparison between uh, inductive and deductive. Now deductive arguments are accurate at the expense of the inability to provide information. Now, so by now you have, it is clear that deductive arguments are accurate, but inductive arguments are not accurate. But what you may not know is that deductive arguments are accurate at the expense of the inability to provide information. Now look at this example. Either it is raining or it is not raining. That's a disjunctive statement. We saw it in uh, deductive reasoning. Either it is raining or it is not raining. Now, uh, this statement is correct, no matter the situation. If it is raining, this statement is correct because it says either it is raining or it is not raining. If it is raining, it's correct. If it is not raining, it's correct. So whether it is raining or not, this statement will always be correct. But does it tell you, does it give you any information about whether it is actually raining? It doesn't, you know. Just a few minutes.
Okay, so um, so statement one is always correct, but it doesn't give you any information about whether it is actually raining. The same goes for statement two. If it is raining, then someone will get wet. Now that's a conditional statement. It just tells you that if it is raining, someone will get wet. But does it tell you whether it is actually raining? It doesn't. So deductive arguments are always accurate, but they don't, they are not able to provide you with information. On the other hand, inductive arguments provide information at the expense of accuracy. So inductive arguments are the other way around. They provide information, but at the expense of accuracy. Now, when you provide an information, the information you've provided is falsifiable. Example, it is raining right now. Now, it is raining right now tells you, it gives you information that it is raining, but that information is falsifiable. Right now in my house, it is not raining. So the statement it is raining right now is false. And if it is not raining where you are, then it means the statement is also false for you. you know? So such information is falsifiable. Any, any, any information that contains empirical information is falsifiable. Falsifiability and science. Any valuable empirical information must be falsifiable. Any statement that is not falsifiable cannot be a verifiable or confirmable statement. Any statement that is absolutely true has no empirical content. So if you want to go the deductive way, you will not be offering information, but if you want to, uh, but you'll be accurate. If you want to go the inductive way, you'll be offering information, but you may not be accurate. Now we're not saying that inductive arguments are always wrong. Sometimes they are correct, sometimes they are wrong. You know, 95% of men are honest. Peter is a man, therefore Peter is honest. Sometimes that argument is true. If Peter is among the 95%, then the argument is true. But if Peter is among the 5% that are not honest, then the argument is false. So sometimes the argument will be false, sometimes it will be, it will be true. You know, but what we're saying is that inductive arguments are essentially falsifiable. Now, the more valuable the empirical information, the more falsifiable. Now look at this empirical statement. The empirical statement, it rains every third Friday of the month. It's more valuable information than it rained just now. Now, how do you calculate the valuability, the, the, uh, the, val the valuable nature of, um, you know, the value of information? You calculate the value of information by finding out what you can use it to do. If you are a farmer and you hear that it rained just now, you can decide to go to farm tomorrow because this, the soil will be soft. You can till it easily. So it is valuable to you. If you hear another statement, it rains every third Friday of the month. That is actually more valuable to you than it rained just now because if you hear that it rains every third Friday of the month, you can go every third Saturday of the month to till the farm because the soil will be soft. So that will be more valuable. But the more valuable, the more falsifiable. It will take only one third Friday of not training to falsify the first statement. Now let's look at the second type of inductive arguments. Arguments with statistical hypothesis as conclusion. This is an example of a st an argument with statistical hypothesis as conclusion. Now this is, an argument, of, uh, this is an argument about people who were vaccinated. Some people were vaccinated for polio. Some of them never suffered it after the vaccination. Some of them suffered it after the vaccination. Michael was vaccinated for polio and never suffered polio. Gilbert was vaccinated for polio and suffered polio. Mary was vaccinated for polio and never suffered it. Stanley was vaccinated and never suffered. James never suffered. Bob suffered it, Jill never suffered, someone never suffered, and so on. So the summary premise, eight out of 10 people who were vaccinated for polio did not suffer polio. So two suffered and eight did not. Then the conclusion is that polio vaccination has 80% potential of preventing polio. You know, so eight out of 10 people is 80%. Now, so that conclusion is a statistical hypothesis. And you can see that statistical arguments are safer to make, or you can say better than 
law-like arguments, you know, because a law-like hypothesis, they refer to all. Yeah, it is always more difficult to defend an argument referring to all. You say all metals expand when heated because 10 metals expand when heated. That's more difficult to defend. But when you say that polio, that 80% of those who take polio vaccination are not likely to suffer polio, then it is safer to defend because you have the data. So we have two types of inductive arguments. We have the ones ending with law-like hypotheses as conclusions and the ones ending with statistical hypotheses as conclusions. Now, hypotheses are technically regarded as conclusions of inductive arguments. So we know that already because they are confirmable statements to be supported, confirmed, or, de or denied by verifiable statements. So this is the end of the class. We'll do causal reasoning next week. So at this point, I would uh, we will receive questions from those who want to ask questions. If you have questions, please ask so that we, we address it before I upload the video to your site. Does anyone have questions? Okay, that's good. So I'm going to end the class. I will upload the video within the next five minutes. So anyone who didn't attend the class should please go and watch it. After watching it, please read your textbooks do all the assignments in your textbooks so that you'll be very familiar with the concepts. All right, so have a beautiful weekend. We shall be meeting on Saturday by this time again for causal reasoning. So until then, keep working hard so that you be a great person. Bye-bye.